mute my microphone, even though I heard you guys can hear me anyway. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to another case of Reasons Why Aliens Will Never Invade Earth. I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, and before we get started, I want to go into a few things now. We're going to be live. We also have the chat. If you want to ask uh, interesting questions, we will watch your chat and we will use some of the questions as we go along. Keep in mind, these podcasts are kind of like PBS, we are viewer driven. So if you want to help out, you go to our link tree and you can find everything you need there to help with it. And thank you, Gabriel, for telling me how the mic's on. I can't help that. It is what it is. So we're going to bring our guest in, who is one of the, you know, she, we are, we actually worked together a long time ago and we worked in the Bayview and we actually covered the park on the sidewalks and everything associated with that. And, and, and we were out there hitting the city trying to get people not to park in the middle of the streets and not park on the sidewalk. And and her name is Lieutenant Tracy McRae, and she was over in Bayview, and now she's part of SFPOA. And I want to bring her in here so that we can... Hello, how are you? What's up, Stanley? What's up? What's up? I mean, we go way back. Yes, we do. Uh, I remember when we did the... Uh, when you came out and we were doing about parking on the sidewalk, but also how street cleaning that they had to call the police in to, so they could get escorted into cleaning the streets in certain parts of the Bayview. Yeah, but that was then and this is now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we had escorts. Now you can't get anything almost. What, what the hell is going on in San Francisco? I mean... Honestly, truthfully, I think the pandemic has really twisted some people up in knots uh, and caused them to do things out of the ordinary that they wouldn't do. Um, no one can deny that, you know, crime is happening in San Francisco, even though we would love for it not to be happening. But it's brazen. It's out there. It's been caught on video. It's in people's faces. And it is happening, right? Now, we can't deny it. I heard that crime is going down because the 2020 stats say there was no crime. But they failed to mention in 2020, we were all locked in the house. Exactly. I mean, we were all, we were all, <laughs> COVID was going on. Things got shut down. Businesses got shut down. Nightlife, you name it. Everything was put on halt, right? So, the hot button issue the year before was all the break auto break-ins, right? So the tourists were getting hit left and right. And then once COVID shut everything down, guess what? There was no tourism. So what were these poor auto burglary people supposed to do? Then you know what went up last year was home burglaries because now their attention was focused, taken away from the cars to now the homes. Even with people at home, burglaries were still being committed. So burglaries shot up. And so total crime last year down 23%, but now it's down 3% just off of the latest statistics that were just put out. And if you go to the San Francisco Police Department's uh, crime data uh, source, their dashboard, this is what you'll see, that the numbers are starting to creep closer together and now pretty soon it's going to be up. And I don't like saying that, but the website shows it. So, you know, I was looking up some stats and I realized that, I mean, I knew a long time ago that there was a long response time for what we call C priority calls. A C priority call for those who don't know is kind of like when everything else is nothing else of the important calls are taken care of, they can handle those. So if you have a break-in of some sort and there's no one there in the house right now, that may fall under a C priority call. Right. And 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 in most cases, you would get there if an officer was available. But then you have the A and the B, which were like A was like drop everything you're doing, get there right away, you know, as quickly as possible. But even I mean, the fire department has a, a criteria to 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 reach a level of what they call um, class one firefighting stage, which they have a certain amount of time to get to a scene. So you guys have to meet a certain standard to arrive for A priority calls, but they're at seven minutes right now. And seven minutes for an A priority call, if you're in trouble, 
That's a long time. It is. I mean, if you're being accosted, you're trying to fend someone off for seven minutes. That's a very, very long time. And think about it. We are, are a city of 49 square miles. So seven minutes in a city of this size, which you think is not really big, we're very packed on each other and very condensed, but that is a long time to get a response there. And so we have to improve that. But the way we improve that is we have to have more officers out on the street. You know, there's no secret that our staffing is short. We've had a lot of retirements, but I think even more so that concerns me the most, especially from the union standpoint, is that we have, pe have had people leave this profession and for whatever reason, right? But they have left this profession, whether it's just to get out altogether, whether it's to go to another agency, not a big city agency, maybe a smaller agency. Um, it, it, this is just not the, the job for them, right? So we're always gonna have retirements, right? You work a certain number of years, you get to retire. We know that's coming. But for me, what concerns me the most is that officers that have 10 years or less, even some that have 15 years or less, they are deciding they don't want to do this anymore. Okay. So now I'm going to get to, you know, because we already said we weren't going to have, you know, no, no question we're off limits. We were going to talk about some, some stuff in the San Francisco that is like, and I'm on the outside looking in. And I'm right. like, and I'm sitting there going, what the hell is going on in San Francisco? I say this a lot to the point where I even had like radio things where about what the hell's going on. So I watched, the, I see the videos. I mean, if you watch Twitter, you'd swear the city was just, you know, going like crazy. I overcome with everything. You got crackheads running around. You got people, you know, you got people selling drugs like there's no tomorrow. I drove through the Tenderloin. Oh my God, it looks like a third world nation over there. Um, but then, but here's where I'm really going to get to the meat. The politicians that are over there, I'm listening to them and they're, they're writing stuff that, and I'm going, what? And they're doing what I call drop and run, which is they post something and then they block their account so people can't respond to them. What the hell is that? Okay, so back in the day, what we would call that, that your mouth is writing a check that you're behind can't cash. So you drop a bomb and you don't stand there to take all the hits that, that are coming your way. So when you have uh, Supervisor Ronan saying, oh, I wish this was a socialist, uh, country or government and then deleting that tweet, but nothing's ever deleted, right? Because now people are like, what are you talking about? Because you look at what's going on in Cuba, for instance, right? And the lines to just get the basics, food, water, right? Socialist government. And then you have uh, Kate Chat Chatfield, I think her name is, the policy director for the district attorney's office telling a constituent, comparing them when they say, you know, they feel unsafe to somehow equate that with the KKK. This is someone who's a policy director who's up at a high level, you know, making these statements. And then when people call it, call them on it, they can't stand there and take the hits or take the heat. So they want to delete stuff. They want to block people. Like, what is that? Like, you know what? If I'm going to say something, I'm going to stand by it and I'll take the hits because this is what an adult does. I'm an adult. So if I'm going to say something, I better make sure I have my facts right and I'm going to stand by it. But you have people in position who, you know, it's me, 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 me. Oh, my feelings got hurt. Deal with it. So I talked to some journalists, some actual journalists who've had their accounts blocked by by by, by members of the... Of, You're a public that? official. You're a what public the? official. How can you block your account from people asking you legitimate questions. So to me, like very thin skin, they can't take criticism. Like I was told a long time ago, you know, you will be criticized. And if it's constructive criticism to make you better, to make you aware of things, you have to be able to accept that. But now, oh my God, you disagree with someone, you know, you hear, oh, it's the cancel culture, this, it's that. Like, really? Like, what is that? I mean, how are you going to tell me anything pertinent if you can't even stand there and deal with the heat when you say something that is absolutely idiotic? And like I said before, I feel like Scar, I'm surrounded by idiots in certain public offices, the, the supervisors, you know, like making these excuses 
for bad behavior, which they should not be doing. So like, what is wrong with, with them? So it looks like to me, it's like they are restricting the hands of the police whose job it is to enforce the laws. So now maybe I heard this wrong and I just want to get some clarification, but I know you guys can't do car pursuits. That went away a long time ago, but that seemed to be a slippery slope because now I'm hearing that you really can't even foot pursue anymore. No. So the decision was made that we would not pursue nonviolent felonies, right? So we make a traffic stop. The person doesn't want to pull over. They speed off. They're gone, but there's nothing we can do about that, right? So we don't do that. And now the foot pursuits, you know, they have their own inherent danger in that. So no, they, they don't want police officers doing foot pursuits unless there are articulable reasons why you felt the need that you needed to do it. So case in point, if there's a violent crime, say, you know, uh, there's a shooting, uh, you feel that that person who did the shooting, who's now taken off in a vehicle, may very well commit another violent felony, you can pursue that vehicle. But as always, there, there are inherent risk in that, right? Especially in a city that's so, that's so condensed as San Francisco. It's not like, you know, we have miles and miles of roads where you can just drive and you won't come across anything. No. So it's about do the rewards outweigh the risks? And you're constantly balancing that act and when you're doing your job. So now with foot pursuits, someone, you know, we had a shoot it, shooting in mid-market area. Okay. Uh, you see someone with the gun. Do you chase after them in a crowded area of mid-market? I would think so. But then you're, what if he turns around and starts shooting and bullets don't have names on them? As we very well know, right? Exactly. They if you want to fire that round, you own that round. You you own it, right? Yeah. I know we own it every time that we get involved in an officer involved shooting. We own every round. But the people who are criminals who are shooting, they don't take ownership of that. You know, that's why, God rest his soul, what happened to Jace Young last 4th of July, trying to enjoy fireworks as a six year old, and he gets shot and he gets killed, right? The list you don't want to be on as a city that a child is killed in your city, right? And through the hard work of our officers and investigators, identifying the perpetrators and trying to bring them to justice. And that's another thing we need to talk about is that okay. we are just one arm of the justice system. Let's get it straight. We don't prosecute people. Oh, we wait, do the wait. Investigation. Hold it. Okay, I'll say it for you. That. I'm glad you mentioned that because yeah. you guys have a prosecutor that ain't prosecuting people. Well, no. I mean, he feels that the people committing the crimes are the real victims, right? Okay. Now, it's not disputed. You can't right wrongs of the past by not doing the right thing today, right? You can't go back in time and make up for everything that was done bad to everyone, every person. You have to deal with what you deal with today. And today, when someone commits a crime, they need to be held responsible. It's called accountability, right? But wait a minute. But wait a minute, Tr Tracy. Accountability is one thing, but when you're actually letting people, ignoring the fact that people are cooking methamphetamines in SROs, and when they when they get when they get arrested, which you guys make an arrest, they I've heard that some of the people in the DA's office had to sign non-disclosure agreements, not to mention that they refused to prosecute people cooking methamphetamines. And if you don't believe that's true, there have been explosions in some of the hotels of people manufacturing meth during COVID. And yeah. the city not only was selling, they were giving away drugs and alcohol. And, and, that, and that was a big, that was, that was blew people's mind when that made the, made the papers, made the news that, Okay, so their reasoning was so they wouldn't go out and get COVID and bring it back and expose other people. But it's like, wait a minute. So that brings me to, you know, like safe injection sites, right? So yeah. again, I mean, the whole tenderloin is really the safe injection site because you could walk by anybody laid out who has probably o OD who is doing drugs, who is selling drugs, who are buying drugs. And 
what's being done about it. The Tenderloin to me is now county jail. Everybody who should be in county jail is somewhere in the Tenderloin. And that district is just growing bigger and bigger with criminals who are not being held in, in, in jail, right? Because the ankle monitor, that's another thing. Let's get straight. Let's be real. Okay. What's the ankle monitor doing? It's just monitoring where the ankle is. <laughs> They're still committing crimes on the ankle monitor. That's how we catch them, right? I said that before when uh, the 94-year-old was, was, was stabbed just out on her walk, and she got stabbed, and the perpetrator had an ankle monitor on, you know? And that's another thing. How, how many crimes do you have to commit to go to jail, right? Well, you know, tell me, I think, what you want? How, how many? What? It should be one. But it's, it's okay. not. So that brings up a good question. So I saw the video of the, and I've seen multiple videos of people hitting like Saks Fifth Avenue and Neiman, uh, Neilis Markup, I mean, Neiman Marcus, <laughs> and, and running out with a whole bunch of, you know, high end bags. And now one video was a recent one was at uh, Neiman Marcus, and there was a guy dressed in a uniform videotaping him run away. And of course, everybody's like, "Oh, look, the cops aren't doing anything." No, no, but no, no. That was a cop. That was not a cop. That was the private security for the other high end store, which I think was Yves Saint Laurent, who has the security guards, and they dress in the black, you know, so they look like us. But you got to look at the patch on the well, show. That's what I did. I put a picture right? of a patch up and said, "Where's the patch? No patch, no, no cop." That wasn't us, right? But you have these brazen crimes being committed by or organized retail theft criminals, right? Who run in, rip, grab, smash, right? They did it at Saks Fifth Avenue, did it at Neiman Marcus, right? Louis Vuitton stores. And, but then you have certain, you know, individuals, uh, our government officials saying, well, you know, it's a, it's, it's a pricey handbag. No, 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 no. No, it's not. What that is, is that that store employs great many employees who need that paycheck, that that pricey handbag when it's sold provides them, right? You have Target, you have Walgreens who now are cutting their hours because of the theft, right? The theft is so rampant that sometimes, yeah, they don't even bother the call, right? It's just, this is what they'll deal with it. So when do they get fed up? and say, you know what, I'm out. You know who got fed up? I don't want to do business in the city. Target got fed up. They didn't get out, but they went, they cut their hours. And you're going, well, well, well wait, What's they cut their hours. Yeah. You know, but you're actually cutting jobs because exactly. you no longer have those people working those hours anymore. Well, how do you know that that person, when they cut their hours, they need that full paycheck, right? To to live, to, to pay their rent in the city. If they live in the city, where it's a very expensive city to live in. Right. How, you know, that's not their second job to try to make ends meet. Right. Put food on the table, buy their kids the things they need. So how far away are they from actually just saying, hey, we're done. We're going to close shop. We'll leave maybe one store open because now how do you run a business and you're constantly losing money and people say, oh, well, they have insurance. And hey, I don't like to get into car accidents because my insurance goes up. And at some point, they're going to be like, you're too much of a risk, and I'm going to drop you. So, you know, stop thinking that there's all this money out there. There isn't. You're in business to make money, to make a profit. Part of that money you're spending is to pay your employees. And if you're not making a big enough profit to pay your employees a living, viable wage, when do you cut bait and run? You know, that's a, that's a good point because at some point, you know, remember we are in the Bayview, you know, the Bayview, the Bayview has very little um, stores that are main, that are corporate. They're like, you know, you have a couple of shops here, a couple of shops there. And then they put the fresh, fresh and. So fresh and <laughs> easy. <laughs> okay. Fresh they and easy. Goes down because of the rampant shoplifting going on. The one that was on third, uh, I remember at Un I think it was by Underwood, right? That they closed down because of the rampant, rampant people just coming in. It was just like a, a conga line of stealing it, it stuff was. out of the store. 
And it, it was just, we couldn't keep up with the calls coming in. Oh, there's another theft. The same thing uh, with the uh, Foods Co., right? Yep. Which is right next to Bayview Station. Yep. And so, Getting hit hard. exactly. We can't have anything nice, right? The In the Bayview District, the Walgreens at 3rd and Williams, that's the closest one other than the one on San Bruno Avenue, which was gone rampant with theft also. They closed the one down at 3rd and Evans in Bayview Plaza, right? And so, again, these places closed, they are hurting the community. The people who rely on getting some of their basic needs from these these stores, the mom and pop stores, right? Like, why can't we have anything nice? So the San Francisco Police Department is down something like 400 officers right now. Yeah. But no one really wants to re-up because there's no reason to re-up because they're getting their, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but is it right? am I wrong that they're having their hands tied by city officials and by the, and you guys feel sometimes, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe and, and correct me, but there are cases where officers take this job because they want to change things in their mind, right? And then you arrest someone for let's say drugs. And I remember back in the day they got a guy with a whole bunch of um, drugs in his mouth, and this was before uh, uh, Bodine, and um, he went to he went to court and they said, well, how can we prove that that was his drugs? even though it came out of his mouth <laughs> and, and they kicked that. They said, and that was the beginning of what we have now. So we've gotten to the point now where the, like if you, if I were to go there and commit a crime right now, I would be held to an accountable level where I'd been like, we arrested Stanley Roberts. He stole, yeah, he only stole $949 worth of merchandise, but <laughs> we're going to prosecute him as a felony. But yet you got people driving out with trash bags. And when I made a joke, it wasn't even a joke. When I made a comment that people were stealing, were, were having calculators and adding it up up into $949, people said, oh, you're an idiot. That's Nobody's going to ever do that. But they're actually grabbing stuff up into that number. And yeah, it may not be directly $949, um, right. but they're filling up trash bags full of stuff. And, and here's one more thing I want to ask you is one of many more things. They say that if you don't commit a crime with a gun, then it's a misdemeanor. But in order for it to be a felony is that you have to actually use the gun. Not If I brandish the gun, it's still a misdemeanor. So what they're doing now is they're breaking their cars, and when you go after them, they pull a gun out. They don't fire the gun, so therefore it still falls under misdemeanor. No, so they break into a car. They go to auto boost, right? Auto burglary, you just charge uh, second degree, right? Which is a wobbler. You can charge it as a misdemeanor or a felony. Say the owner of the car comes back and is trying to stop them from taking his property and they pull out a gun. That has now turned into a robbery. Robbery by force or fear, street or public place with a firearm. That is a felony. Okay, so why are they charging people with felonies? Because I'm watching people nowadays running out with merchandise with a gun in hand and nothing happens. You know what? You need to get someone on the DA's office to answer that question. To come well, in here and ask, why, why aren't you prosecuting that? You know, and then I get this roundabout way with them saying, you know, no, we are going to court. We are, you know, uh, prosecuting people. Really? Where? Because I don't see it because our court system is the last one to be open. Remember, our court system isn't fully open. We're still waiting. And then, you know, we get thrown in our face. Well, you guys don't make arrests. Really? Because I do recall in the examiner like a month back, they did interview a public defender who says, oh, yeah, the police make a lot of arrests because my caseload is just so overwhelmed with arrests and trying to get my clients their day in court. So what is it? Do we make arrests or do we not make arrests? Right. We make arrests. We make great arrests. But then you got this two tier public defender system in the city that's not working. Right. So you're running this game. We're going to delay it for this. We're going to ask for this, which before, if you were a prosecutor, you can make a case with a lot of the evidence that we bring you. But now we got video evidence, not only our own, our body worn camera evidence. You got surveillance evidence. You, uh, you, you got it so much. You're throwing up evidence, right? But for some reason, it's still not enough to prosecute people. You got to wait until someone's arrested for the 12th time 
to bundle the bundling effect of all these cases together before you decide to prosecute. So they got arrested the first time you didn't do anything and it took them till their 12th arrest for you to now do something. I don't know. That doesn't sound right to me. So in the meantime, more people get victimized, right? When you could have took care of the issue in the first place, right? Again, we are one arm of the justice system. You have the prosecutor and you have judges, right? And when they say that, oh yeah, you know, we opposed his, uh, his release, really? Because when I looked at the court record, which I went and paid for with my own money, because I wanted to see from my own eyes, uh, yeah, you said, okay, yeah, we oppose it, but that's it. How are you fighting for the victim? Because you're the voice of the victim. The victim is relying on the prosecutor to carry the justice for them. And then they're not doing it. So of course you got shoplifting going on. You have burglaries going on. You have shootings and homicides. And so I'm sure some, some certain residents are feeling less and less, less and less safe, right? Because you hear about it all the time. You have this stuff on social media, right? Because everybody's got a camera now. Everybody, they got this phone. Everybody got a phone. Everybody got a phone. So everybody's filming. Now you have all these apps, the citizen app that alerts you, hey, 700 feet, uh, there was just someone who got robbed. Oh, you know, uh, 1,000 feet, someone just got shot. Oh, 1,500 feet, somebody got their car. I get in. the alerts, even in the right? Bay Area. So it's like it's on top of you all the time. And so it's just, I mean, it's just mind boggling that something that just should be simple to do is very hard and for people just to do their job right so you said yeah we're 400 officers short right uh we right. have people who have left because it's very expensive to live here the commute is long they do feel uh, demoralized as if they don't have the support of certain elected officials you know some people don't like uh how our chief has handled certain things. Well, but let's be realistic. The chief is really the mayor. I'm just going to put that out there. The chief of San Francisco Police Department is Mayor London Breed. I'm going to say that because I've, that's the way it's, it seems to me. They're politicians. At that level, you are a politician. And I can't speak for him. I'm not saying anything about him. But at that level, you're a politician. You deal with a lot of other things. At my level- I can say it. Yeah, at my level, I'm dealing with what our officers need out on the streets to do their job safely, properly, right? Treating everyone the same. But at a certain level, you're a politician, right? Because you're dealing with other issues, right? There's other games going on behind the scenes. And for me, I like what I'm doing right now. I'm very happy to be where I'm at. I never expected this position at the POA to be the vice president. And that's another thing. This is not your daddy POA, right? We have changed our representation. They keep saying how they want more representation from community of colors, how we're so diversified. Well, the same thing is with the POA. We're very diversified now. And we're not opposed to sitting down with anyone who wants to come and we can work on solutions. But I don't have time to play games and I don't have time to people to, you know, omit and say one thing and then do something else. I don't have time to play that because I'm an adult. I'm not playing a child's game, right? Because right. these issues are very serious. Our shootings are up 111% over last year. But I read, I read that your auto burglars are up 700%. Is that even a real number? Uh, right? like, what is that? That sounds like the, the car is robbing the car is robbing the car. Is it being what? robbed by the car? Our, our murders are up 8%. I mean, we're not Chicago, we're not New York and stuff, but still that's concerning, right? From what it from what it was. So now that everything is starting to open back up, right? You want people to return to the city because yeah, our, tourism is, is our number one thing here. And you want people to come back to the city to feel safe. But how safe are you feeling when you're seeing on the news, people just coming up to cars in the middle of traffic, busting out windows, climbing in your car, and taking your property and you're sitting there, what can you do? Right. And then they point a gun at you, daring you to do something. Right. What, 
what's your average person supposed to do? So, so, so why so is it happening in San Francisco? I'll tell you why. Because criminals know that they can come here, nothing's going to happen to them. They're going to get kicked or they're going to get an ankle monitor, right? And, and, and go through that revolving door. We have had criminals say on our BWC when we have arrested them, oh, we don't have nothing to worry about because, you know, Bodine, he don't let us out no way. So it's like a, it, what's going on? You know what? That's scary. It's scary. And I feel for the people, and, and, and especially right now with all the Asian attacks that's been going on. I mean, I'm watching every day there's some new person being attacked. The Asians are being attacked, either just random attacks. Right. Why is that? Right? Why is that? Why are they now like you picking on, on elderly? I mean, a 94 year old woman getting stabbed. What is that? These people have lost their mind. Totally so, lost their mind. I read Nancy, tell me her last name. Nancy, she's a politician. She wrote about. Oh, Skinner? Oh, that's it. Thank you. Nancy Skinner. I read that she posted that they were, she was trying. Now, remember, defund the police wasn't supposed to be about re limiting, re remove, removing officers. It was to take away certain things. They thought that the cops didn't need, like, like the uh, the big armored trucks and what have you. But it's turned into, which people say that's not what it is, to get rid of cops. And now I, I saw her write on the internet, on Twitter, that her that she wants to get, she wants to reduce the amount of cops. You're already 400 short. I mean, how can, I mean, in some cities, I'm sorry, let me take that back. In some parts of the Bay, let me narrow it down even more. In San Francisco, let's say Ingleside. There are cases where you had one officer covering the entire Ingleside district. And this was before we started defund the police. This was before all this. And yeah, they had a sergeant and one officer. So his job was to handle all the priority calls in Ingleside. And if anybody knows how big Ingleside is, it's a pretty large area. It so, is. so how do you re reduce which you already have. I mean, it's like saying throwing everything out and saying, you know what? Let's just put a fence around it and call it an amusement park. So we were ringing this bell back in 2017, right? I was ringing the bell. Yeah, I think in the next five years, there are a boatload of officers who will have the age and the time to retire, right? So what can we do to retain them, right? Because that's a lot of knowledge leaving out the door. And in the meantime, how can we bring younger people in to make this job attractive, right? So what, where can we solve two issues, right? Recruitment and retention. Because, yeah, not a lot of people want to come and do this job. But then again, people pick up the phone and call 911 and expect us to respond, right? So they still call us. For all the calls, we said that, hey, you know what? Yeah, mental health. Yeah, send someone else, right? But again building up the infrastructure because I don't see too many people knocking the, on the door to be a social worker either. Right. So again, crisis happened 24 seven. So at two in the morning, when these teams that I know they have a couple of teams out now that specifically really work in the tenderloin, but that's like 10 to four. So when someone's having a crisis at 2 AM, who's responding? It's us, the police, right? Who's responding to that noise complaint when two teenage daughters are arguing over makeup at two in the morning and their mom can't control them? That's a parenting problem. That's not a police matter. You know, I yeah, agree. I if we had to call the cops and my mom, I wouldn't even be sitting here talking to you today because my mom knew how to handle her business, right? That's a parenting issue. So again, we have been the de facto, you know, cure all for a lot of things for a long, long time. And when they should have been building the infrastructure to handle these issues, they weren't. And then all of a sudden here comes the defund movement. And now we wanna take away money from the police department and send it to who, right? So you have a ton of nonprofits in the city. Open their books. Don't get where me started. You, hey, where are you wait, spending your money at? Wait. Boo, where Don't, are you spending your money at? Do not get me started with the nonprofits. Where, because where's the money going? You know where it's going? Go, go, go to the nonprofit and look at the cars they drive. Go look at the cars they drive. Go look at their houses. 
Bro, I, look, don't get me started. Don't get me. You know what? You about to get me. You about to get me mad. <laughs> no, I'm. But I, but I'm saying like, where is that? No, money the going? money is where going is into the, people's pockets. Where is the accountability? Right. You guys, because money isn't the object. Obviously, in this city, because we have well, a lot of it. Right. We have a lot of it. With the money given to us from COVID to close our deficit, we were looking at a really high deficit. Right. We have now closed that. So where's the money going and why are we still seeing people laid out on the street, right? Well, overdosing 20, left and right. $20,000 per tent. Was that what it was? Is that the Taj Mahal tent? I'm, like, I'm thinking for like, $20,000, it better come with Wi-Fi, uh, uh, um, internet access. It better be able to drive that car, that tent. Is that but here's where, standard, I'll tell you where it goes. Standard? Look, all the jokes aside about the, go look at the cars. Right. Let me, let me put it to you this way. So the money that usually comes in is kind of on a circle. So you donate to the nonprofit or the city, you know, gives the money to the nonprofit to do stuff. The nonprofit hires a bunch of clip, clip walkers with the clips to walk around and get information so we can figure out how to fix something. And then just like, and I said this a while back. So remember in the hate, they had a problem with, you know, they had sit and lie that they tried to do and sit and lie didn't quite work. It more like was sit and let's just lie to them and say we got it fixed. So sit and lie basically was where they were, as the cops were writing tickets for urinating in public, the coalitions, the homeless coalitions were, were taking the tickets and getting them signed off or going to court to fight the tickets. Basically saying, hey, you can pee all you want to. We're going to take care of your ticket. Don't worry about it. Right. So this is what was going on. And I said, if this keeps up, and I think at one point, one of the, homeless um, coalitions almost went bankrupt because they were literally <laughs> using money to do that. Well, now, and just like in Los Angeles, they have more and more nonprofits that are being, that are joint, that are, that are growing right now. I mean, they're growing exponentially because they're getting all this money. And, you know, it's funny that I'm, I'm, I'm all for helping people. Right. But if the money's not being used to help them, then we're not really using the money properly. But I mean, like, you have to get to a certain point, you know, that you want to pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah, for sure. Some people are down and out on their luck and they need a helping hand, right, to get them on their feet. Hey, I grew up in public housing. Public housing was meant as a short term solution so you can get up on your feet and you could move forward. Right. My mom did that. Right. And so each generation wants what's better for the next generation. And so my grandmother always told me, get your education and get you a piece of property. And I was very fortunate to do both in this city, to own a home in this city, right? Not easy to do, but it was done because I hustled, right? I worked hard. I did what was needed to be done. You know, I wasn't afraid of failure, right? You learn from, from failing, right? Now you got people just handing out participation trophies. What, what do you learn from that? You know, you have to learn from your mistakes. You have to learn how to pick yourself up when you fall down and move forward. I've had family members that have drug problems, right? And went round and round with them. And thank God, you know, some of them have gotten clean and they've lived their life. But the constant hand holding, the constant telling people, oh, it's going to be okay with no real push for them to do better. Then you're going to see the tenderloin. You're going to see it keep expanding, right? You're going to see people not taking responsibility for their behavior. Right. That's not OK. It really isn't. And we're not helping anyone by ignoring and walking over bodies and not doing anything about it. And so I get it. The job that I have, I'm held to a higher standard and there's accountability. But our other partners need to be held accountable, too. Right. We're, we're trying to make this better. We're trying to get ahead and move ahead and move forward. But not if we were always taking two, three, four steps back and nothing is getting done and everybody just talks about it and nothing is being implemented. You know, like I said, you knew you had an issue. You should have been building the infrastructure and yeah, relying less on police to do certain things so we can focus on the true criminals who really want to go out and cause havoc and hurt people, right? So, and here we are, you know, and it's just, it's just sometimes it's just really incredibly frustrating. So let's just talk about the frustration level, because I understand for you it's frustrating. You're a lieutenant. You, you see everything that goes on um, out in the street. You see the officers come back. 
they're, 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 they're trying to do the right thing, but then they realize that they get villainized uh, because of what they tried to do because they think they did the right thing. But then it turns out that the way social media plays it up or the way someone else plays it up is that they kind of, that they messed it up. And, and, but also you're also being judged by the rest of the world because they're like, look at San Francisco. Why aren't the police doing anything? So I'll ask you that question. Why aren't the police doing anything? Well, I would hit back on that. We are doing things, right? We are investigating these brazen thefts, right? We have arrested the guy who committed the Walgreens, the caught on the bicycle. We had arrested him before. And then he's arrested doing the same thing at the other Walgreens, right? He was out. He had a warrant for his arrest because he didn't show up to court. I think they did an article in the paper. 55% of people have reoffended while being let out. That means they committed a new crime, right? So, and the number's probably even higher than that. Let's be honest. So we are out there doing our job. But again, if we hand it off to the prosecutor and then they're not doing their job, then this is what you get, right? Because people forget, I see this stuff every day. Every day I see the number of reports being written, the number of arrests being made, right? And with everything that's going on, you still have officers that are going out and doing their job because that is what we are supposed to do. We are public servants and we are serving the public. Could we use more officers? Damn straight. Damn straight. We need a lot more officers for this city, right? But you have these politicians wanting to hold us hostage, you know, holding our budget hostage, right? For what? For what purpose? To keep the citizens unsafe, the tourists not safe, tourists don't want to come here, right? So you mentioned the tourists, and I'm going to mention Fisherman's Wharf because I've been watching down there, and it's like business owners are being held hostage by the amount of crime that's going on down there right now. And, you know, the 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 the, the Alioto fish markets that they're being attacked in broad daylight and the fire department arrives before the police department gets there. As a matter of fact, the police department showed up only because the fire department called them because they didn't respond to anything else. And it's it's crazy because, you, you know, you know, I used to walk the streets and I walked the streets when I was in the Bay Area and I walked and I worked and I did my segments out there. You know for a fact that I walked the Bayview by myself. I walked Fisherman's Wharf by myself. I walked all these areas and, 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 and leaving the city, I walked International Boulevard by myself. Yeah. And it's really frustrating and it's kind of sad when you talk to people who live out there who are afraid and, and they're losing money. And then people are going, well, why didn't somebody do something? Okay. So I'm going to say this right now to San Francisco. You guys need to do something. Bodine, you need to get off your butt and start prosecuting people and stop hiding behind uh, other people when they ask you questions. Stop hiding behind FOIAs. When somebody asks you, for a, when they put out a FOIA request, you guys need to respond to it. The only way to fix this city is for everybody to fix this city. Not just, you can't rely on the San Francisco Police Department to fix everything. You know, you can't no, call you can't. them when someone dumps trash out their front door. That's not a San Francisco Police Department job. That's You call the city and say, hey, can you clean the trash up? You don't call 911 because your kid didn't come, you know, it's, it's out last, out not partying. You know, it's different if they ran away and you need to get them back. That's right. different. But you got to look and, and pick your battles. And I'm sorry. You know, I, I really love San Francisco. I, you know, I spent 20 years there. I worked with you. I worked in the baby. I worked, you know, Isaac Espinosa was a friend of mine until he was tragically, excuse me, tragically gunned down. Um, so I know the Bay Area. You know, I left because I couldn't afford to live there anymore. But now I think I need to come back because people are blaming me. <laughs> Stanley Roberts, they're blaming me for the city going down. And, and trust me, I had nothing to do with it. But everything you say is true. I'm a native. I was born and raised here. I still live here. I have skin in the game. You know, I kind of tired of people who aren't from here, who come here and want to use their grandiose ideas as experiments in the city. And when they don't work, they pick up and leave and they go on to the next thing. Right. We are not a city to be experimented with. That That's not happening here. Well, right. you that, you guys you guys are a petri dish of experiments right now. They're trying to we see are. what can and what it's, can, and it's 
and it's maddening and that you know you're playing with people's livelihood with their safety uh with you know how they can go out and not be free to walk around and don't feel safe because they're looking over their head is on a swivel as we say right like let's be real if we need we need to get this back under control it's going to take a monumental effort and i'm not feeling sorry you know like beretta said in the 70s if you can't do the time don't do the crime don't do the crime don't get caught so you get caught you get caught man and woman up no you got caught right and deal with the consequences but so, people don't people don't want to be caught today all so, with me so here's where you know there's a problem in san francisco here's why you know there's a problem in san francisco drive to the very edge of um of the Bayview and brisbane that's where the line is for san mateo county flagstaff uh, uh is it flagstaff or i'm saying his name wrong i'm sure but the DA, Wagstaff. Wagstaff, thank you. I'm thinking of Flagstaff, Arizona. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Wagstaff, he prosecutes. He does. And people will tell you that if you commit a crime in San Mateo County, you better hope you, your butt make it back into San Francisco so you can get away with it. Seven Mile House is the cutoff right down there on Bayshore, the Seven Mile House. Yep. You know, tap out across that line. But it's yep. true. If you don't fear any consequences, you're just going to keep pushing the envelope and being bolder and bolder and bolder no matter what. And yeah, the homeless problem, it is crazy. And you talk to people, they're not even from here, right? It's the same thing when they cite these stats. Oh, you know, black people only make up 3% of the population, but they're stopped, you know, 43% of the time. Really? Well, where are they from? Because I guarantee you, they're not all from San Francisco. So stop with that, right? You can skew numbers any way you want to, but let's dig down deep, lift up those layers, and let's get to the truth. But people don't want to do that, right? They just want to say stuff, and it's the gospel, and it's the truth. But I'm not buying that because it's a load of you-know-what. I found one. You know what? I found an area in San Francisco where all crimes are prosecuted. You, you're going to wait. Where is this Where going? is that? San Francisco International Airport. <laughs> <laughs> you know why? Because it's in another county in San Mateo. Because it's not San Francisco. It's, it's not. It's San Mateo. It's, so it's people go there though. thinking, wait, wait. I, I've actually had talked to some cops there and says, hey, I go there. People go there to commit crimes and go, wait, where are you taking me from? You know, I got, it was, I'm in San Francisco. I'm no, at the airport. Not. They go, no, you're not. They're taking me to Redwood City. That's right. I, I and guess what? People to Redwood City jail. It's and not it, fun. Wagstaff will take you, I almost said him Flagstaff again, Wagstaff will take you and lock you up so fast it'll make your head spin. So, I mean, you know, when people, I think, feel, again, there are no consequences, there's zero chance that they, when they're caught, that they will stay in jail for a long time. You release people out on ankle monitor. Uh, why shouldn't they continue to do what they've been doing, right? Again, why should it take the 12th or 15th time they have committed a crime to be held accountable, right? So people need to pay attention. You know, this ranked choice uh, voting, we need to, to do away with that, right? You need to pay attention on records of people that include judges, you know, holding them accountable also, right? I get it. We're held accountable to a very much higher standard. And when we do wrong, yeah, we get, we're going to get it too. Right. What happened in in, in um, Minneapolis with the Chauvin. Right. That that was the right thing to do. He was arrested and prosecuted with the system that we have in place. Can it be improved? Of course it can. But for right now, it's the best thing that we got. Right. And we made it work. What besides that, George Floyd was murdered in the way and the manner that he was. Right. You had three other cops standing there who didn't have the guts to say, this is wrong, this is get wrong. up off of them. So we failed them too, because we did not allow them or to give them the honest to say, yeah, we can't have this, right? And so, yeah, if you see something wrong, yeah, you speak up and you take action, right? And that's for everyone. You don't have to wear a uniform to do that, 
right? But if you are in a uniform and you do see something wrong, take some action. You know, Thank you, you might be saving your job and someone's life all at the same time, right? It's called, yeah, it's accountability. Someone asked me one day and they go, let me ask you a question, Mr. Roberts. If you were out with the police and you saw the police doing something really bad, would you ignore it? And I said, okay, let's try it this way. If I was out without the police and I was robbing the bank, would the police ignore me? No. No. I'd be on the, I'd be on the way to jail. So no one can ignore when someone's doing something wrong, period. But, you know, I call this, this podcast you're on is Reasons Why Aliens Will Never Invade Earth. Because I believe that somewhere in the galaxy, there's a huge billboard that tells everybody to avoid this big, big blue ball because it ain't safe here. And San Francisco would be you, the you, prime example. Stanley, you don't even have to go that far. Uh, any drop down in the TL, they'd be like, get me the heck out of here because I can't, I can't, I can't deal with this. I'm like, you know, I drive through the Tenderloin and I'm looking and I'm just thinking, how did we get to this point? Because as a teenager in the 80s, right? In the 80s, we're riding the bus everywhere. We took Muni everywhere, right? To get around town. And we could go through the Tenderloin. We're not getting accosted. We're not, you know, anything. And now I look and what, how did we get to this point? How did we get to this point in San Francisco, which is a world-class city, right? We have a budget that is bigger than most countries. Most oh, countries. Yeah, I know. And we have what we have. People dying in the street, laid out, right? Well, how do we get to this point? How do we fix it? And and while you think of that for a second, uh, people that are watching, you know, we, we said before that if you, if you had a question, you can type it into the chat. And if we decide to use your question, we'll, we'll um, um, Tracy can see it just as well as I can. So if she wants to answer it, she can. Um, you're welcome to ask a question. We're going to be wrapping this up pretty shortly. So, sorry. So you don't want to hold your thoughts back right now, and you know, keep it, keep it clean, please, because the bots will, will will boot you out. But how do we fix it, Tracy? How do we fix San Francisco as a whole? I mean, not sugarcoating it that we do have an issue. We have a crime issue, and we need to combat that. Right? We need officers, more officers out on the street. We need everyone, all hands on deck all arms of the justice system to be able to work together to do their job, do what you were elected to do, first of all, right? That is what people are expecting you to do. And don't shy away from it. Don't shy away from the tough things. You know, life is tough, right? But we need to get through this and get back on track and that people know that they can't come to San Francisco and commit these type of crimes because you will be held responsible. We will do our part as the police department, but I need the district attorney to do their part. I need the judges to do their part because it can't just be one out of three. It really can't. And it can't be the politicians turning a blind eye to and not willing to speak up and say something. You know, constructive criticism is really good to make you focus on trying to do the right thing. Stop being so damn sensitive, right? Everybody's sensitive today because they don't want to get criticized. They want to be loved and liked. Well, you know what? You don't have to love me and you don't have to like me. I love me and I like me. And I know when I'm doing the right thing is for the betterment of everyone. So for the people who are too sensitive to do their job, there's the door, see your way out and let somebody else come in and do it. Because if you can't stand the heat, get, get out the kitchen, just get on out. Cause you're not helping. You know, there was a question in the chat box saying, I sometimes wonder what would have happened if a bystander, Good Samaritan, had shot and killed Derek Chauvin in order to save the life of George Floyd. They wouldn't have been prosecuted in my book because they would have been doing the right thing. They would have been saving the life of a man, regardless of what he had did in his past, whatever, but they would have been saving someone's life who was being killed. And if you're wearing a uniform, that's not what we're supposed to be doing, right? We protect people's lives, the sanctity of life, all of that. Yeah, we were supposed to protect people and do the right thing. One of the biggest myths out there is that police are taught to shoot to kill. And I tell people that's not what they were taught. They're taught, they're, they're taught to eliminate the threat. So eliminate the threat means make sure this person is longer a threat to anyone else. Exactly. And, and that's what, you know, you try to explain to people and they don't, they have their mind made up. And, and I talk about this and I've said it before. 
the 15 seconds of bull crap, which has been out there. And where I got that 15 seconds from is because the original Instagram was 15 seconds long. And people would post video of 15 seconds and draw a conclusion, a beginning and an end to the middle of a 15 second incident. And that was how they, they drew an entire conclusion and nothing else mattered. Right. And there are people on the internet right now who their main purpose is to stir the pot. And we know that. We know they're stirring the pot. We know that, you know, everybody is, not everybody is bad. Not everybody is good. There's going to be, you know, but if you know they're bad, then call them out for their, for what they're doing wrong. But right. at the same, right. And at the same time in San Francisco, it's important that the politicians, as you said, get off their butt and do something. Because, you know, I've called this many, many years before that if these things are fixed, and I did in Oakland with the illegal dumping, I said, if they don't fix the illegal dumping now, it's going to be a grandioso problem. And guess what? It is now a grandioso problem. Uh, the freeways that, now, even yeah. the freeways have tents on them now and is garbage everywhere. And so, you know, Susan Dyer Reynolds who writes for the Marina Times, Lou Barberina also but she had said something about, you know, being on Hypocrite Hill. We got a lot of po politicians setting up tents on Hypocrite Hill, right? Do as I do as I say, not as I do is the saying. And just, you know, you look at the school board. Thank God I don't have a child in the public school system in San Francisco because it is a mess. Because the very people they keep saying they want to help, the communities of color, they're the ones who are getting left behind. And you and I know that's true because I did tutoring at Bret Hart Elementary, you know, and it's just like, what are we doing here? Again, posturing. I want to look good for the cameras, all of that, right? No, call it like it is. And that's why I love Susan Dyer Reynolds for saying it the right way, holding people accountable. And you know what? You may hate her, you may love her, but she's telling you the truth. But the purpose of the of journalists is to hold people accountable. Yeah. But you how can you hold them accountable, accountable if they block their accounts or they block you? I, right. I understand it. I've talked to her, and she told me that one of the guys I can't think of the name right now, but he literally blocked her his person, her personal, and her. I mean, come on now, that's not what Twitter was meant for. Twitter wasn't meant for you to block something you could, you know, post and run. You know. What, wasn't it Mike Tyson who said that people think they could? post stuff and not get punched in the mouth. It was something like that he said, making making people believe, you know, that they're invisible on social media where you could just say something, you know, and nobody's gonna gonna step to you. And then people step to you, you running away, you know, tail tucked between your legs because, oh my God, some, someone's being mean to me. Like, grow up, grow, you're an adult, you know, and plus you're an elected official. That's embarrassing. That is just embarrassing for you to behave like that, right? And so I just hope, you know, the people of the city, especially when they go to vote, right? You know, you take that seriously. I have not missed an election uh, since I turned 18 and, and can vote, right? Because my grandparents were part of the generation that fought for that, for us to have the right to vote. And I get it. It is very important. Whatever party you believe in, whatever, just vote. Right. So you could be heard because to me, if you don't vote, you don't have a right to complain. You have a choice to have your voice heard, you know. So anything else before we wrap this up, anything you want to say that we forgot to talk about? I just want to thank you. It's just really great to see you again. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, hopefully, you know, that what we've said throughout this hour, that it uh, resonates with people and that people know, you know, as police officers, we are here to, here to help, and we are helping, and we're doing the best job that we can, but we need a little more help from our, our partners. You know, we can't go it alone. Um, we don't want this crime happening in our city. We want people to come and enjoy and feel safe, and we're trying to work our hardest to make that happen. But if you keep letting criminals go and not holding them responsible, then it's your fault, Boudin, and you can't run and hide and say, it wasn't me. Let's blame this other this other guy. It was the other guy, right? It wasn't me. I, I didn't do it. Yeah, you did. Because you know we have this issue. So start doing something and get off your behind. So I'm going to say this to Bowdoin, Bodine, Bowdoin, Nancy, all these politicians. Hey, I'm on Twitter. 
I put my handle right down there. Stanley Roberts. It's not hard to remember. If you want to talk to me about it, come on here. Let's do it. Let's talk. But I'm going to tell you, it ain't going to be an easy talk. So if you ain't ready for easy talk, then you ignore me and just move on. But we're going to try to make San Francisco better. One way or another, Tracy, we're going to make San Francisco better. And that, it's got to be better because we can't. it can't go on the way it's been going on. You're absolutely it, right. It literally cannot keep going on the way it's going because it's going to implode on itself. It's already to the point where you're going to lose money on, uh, and I'm going to, you know, um, you're going to lose money on um, tourist dollars because the words want to get out that it's not safe to be there. There's even memes now out. There's a meme I watched today about the auto break ins, you know, that you're, you're almost guaranteed to have your car broken into. And when I said I was coming to the Bay Area, someone said, hey, can we meet? You know, I talked to a, um, I was talking to an investor out there about maybe coming back to the Bay. And I said, can we meet in San Mateo County? Because I have luggage in my car and I can't afford to have my luggage stolen. I drove, I drove through the Bay. I drove down by, um, and I posted this video. I drove through the old Candlestick Park. It's, it's, it's crazy over there. I mean, and people say, well, you need to talk about the good stuff. Well, make me, give me good stuff. Yes, I want to talk about the good stuff. It's, here's what I know good about San Francisco. It's by the water. That's pretty much it right now. And I love the water, but I don't want to have to worry about coming back and my car broken into. I don't want right. to worry about I'm getting attacked and I call 911 and you guys show up Seven 10 minutes, minutes later. later, you know, or you get pushed down to a B priority and you show up 22 minutes later. Yeah. Tracy? You're exactly right. I love you, Stanley. Thank you again. Thank you for having me on. Uh, and hopefully, yeah, we will we will solve this and and everyone tries to do their job because I'm trying to do mine, man. Tracy, when I knew you were you were talking, I said, you know what? I got to call her. And I called. And you know what? You didn't wait to answer my call. It wasn't like, let me get back to you. You was like, I'm on. When can we do this? Yeah. I was like, let's do it right now. I let's, said, no, no, let's no. Let's do wait it. Wednesday. Let's just give people a chance to know we're going to be here. So thank you again. Anytime no, don't thank me. me. Thank you. I mean, let's, if you want to keep, you know, one day let's come back before you retire and talk about how we made things better. I would love that. And hopefully it's sooner rather than later. Because I got 15 months and I'm oh. out. I'm oh, I got I got to get my shovel and start digging. <laughs> yeah. So. Tracy, thank you. Thank you, Stanley. You take care of yourself. All right. So I want to thank you for joining us on this edition of Rawini, <laughs> which is actually reasons why aliens will never invade Earth. It's important. That I have a link tree. If you go there, it's uh, you can see the link there. You can write it down. I'll leave that for a few seconds. But this will also be posted on Apple, Google, and Spotify podcasts probably later today. So you can go there. But we also have Millennial Boom, and we have, of course, what used to be called People Behaving Badly is now called Caught Misbehaving because you know that story there. But the truth of the matter be is that I do want to come back there and try to help San Francisco because I love San Francisco. I lived there for 20 years. That is part of my home. And it saddens me to watch what's been going on out there. And, you know, it's, it's crazy that, that people come there and don't feel safe. And people drive there and they worry about their product, their things being stolen. It shouldn't be that way. And if it can be safe in San Mateo County, it can be safe in San Francisco State and um, City and County. There's no reason why it can't be. So follow me on my link tree. Um, you can find a way to help us support this because all this is done by, you know, it's, it's, it's viewer generated. We, you help me and we keep doing these things. And we want to have more discussions about San Francisco in the future. And again, I want to thank Tracy for being here. Thank you guys for joining us. And um, please subscribe. We'll have more in the future. Thank you very much and have a good day.